when I landed in this town in the middle of nowhere, you know, they looked at me and said, basketball. And I said, yep. And they said, you're tall. You can play basketball. And this is not what I joined the Peace Corps for, but they gave me a basketball and off I went on the college team. And I remember saying, but I'm a foreigner. You can't, certainly, this certainly can't be, you know, legal. And they said, well, you know, we've, we check the rules. There's no explicit rule that says foreigners can't play because foreigners had never been here before. And it was a nice introduction to the adage I think we all know when we've been in China that it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission. I'm Michael Meyer. I'm the author of The Road to Sleeping Dragon, Learning China from the Ground Up. I arrived in China completely by accident. I didn't think I would ever go to China, let, you know, even as a tourist. Um, I was fluent in Spanish. I applied to join the Peace Corps, and they offered me seven countries, none of which spoke Spanish, and it was Mongolia and Malawi and Vladivostok, and they were going on and on. And I finally said, no, I don't want to go to these places. And they said, well, you don't get to choose. You know, it's not Club Med, it's the Peace Corps. And I said, well, then I choose no. And weeks went by, and the phone rang, and with great finality, the voice said, China. And I said, I didn't know China you know, had the Peace Corps. Um, and of course, this was just restarting the program after the events of 1989. So I was among the first volunteers. I was the first volunteer at this um, rural college in, in southeast Sichuan. I don't think it's an accident that the majority of Peace Corps volunteers are from the mi Midwest. I don't think it's an accident that many of the Peace Corps volunteers who stayed on in China to become journalists or writers are from the Midwest. <laughs> Maybe there's some similarity there with the sort of frontier, prairie sense of humor. Um, or maybe it's that sense, again, that you know, if you're an elementary school teacher in rural Minnesota, in many ways, your daily routine and what makes you happy and what makes you stressed are very similar to what a school teacher in rural Sichuan experiences. And in my group, there were 15 volunteers who went in my group, um, and seven left. And a commonality, you know, I didn't know you could quit. You can quit the Peace Corps. They'll have you out of there in, in two or three days. Um, but the commonality of those seven was that they had been to Beijing, they had been to Shanghai, they had been to Taiwan, they had been to Hong Kong. And they thought, well, why would I live like this, right? Whereas for me, this was an upgrade from my life as a student teacher eating ramen and being broke. You know, here I am in, in the, the, cuisine, the culinary capital of the world, even if the floors are dirt and you're scraping your chopsticks you know, to, to get the germs off, as they say. Um, I'm eating, I'm surrounded by very, as you said, very empathetic people who appreciate someone trying to learn their language. Now, at the time, I didn't realize I was learning Sichuanese and not Mandarin, because when I moved to Beijing, people sort of looked agog at me, like, what are you? you know, what language are you speaking? Um, but it was, you know, and I don't know if I appreciated it at the time, either how lucky it was. I think the older I get, and this is common for everybody in their 40s and 50s, right, is that the, big, the most precious resource in your life becomes time, right, much more than, than money or prestige. Um, and I look back on this time now and I think, oh my gosh, how wonderful to have all that time, just as you said, to absorb and to make note of it. I find nowadays, and I'm speaking very generally here, but it seems like my undergraduates and graduate students and people I talk to around the country who are younger don't have that same passion or interest or even awareness that they can go abroad and learn a culture anew. And I always ask them, why is that? Because, you know, Peace Corps is in Vietnam now and in, in Myanmar, these great opportunities to go abroad. And they say, well, it kind of feels like it's been done. It's been explained, you know? And they'll say, well, look at the huge gaps on the China bookshelf, a great book about life in Gansu, a great book about life in Xinjiang. And again, people say, like, well, no, we learn about China in our majors, or we learn about China through the, the media, but it feels like we sort of know it. And then I have to work backwards and say, well, what do you really know about China? Because it might be a little bit different when you get there. That was certainly my experience. Um, I didn't know, for example, that Chinese people are funny in the same way that Americans are funny. I think our countries share a very similar sense of humor beyond appreciating the Three Stooges. Um, a lot of self-effacing humor, a lot of wordplay puns, sarcasm, and so forth. Before I went to China, I thought you know, it was 1.2 at the time, billion people sort of marching lockstep, quoting Chairman Mao, because that was the, the vision, because most correspondents report from Beijing or Shanghai, if we're lucky, right? Maybe Guangzhou. Um, and it's only when you're there and you're making that effort to go out and see these places and you start realizing there's 14 countries that border this place, more than any place in the world. Maybe that influences how China acts on the global stage, for example. 
Um, it wasn't until I started re you know, trying to go to those places and see it for myself that that became real to me. And you touch on it. You know, in this book, I go to Tibet. I go to far uh, western Xinjiang. I'm down in Yunnan along the Vietnam border and then back up along the North Korean border in the Northeast. And again, you realize it's amazing sometimes. I know that oft quoted, and maybe it's apocryphal, the Sun Yat-sen observation that China is a shifting tray of sand. Um, but it certainly feels that way when you're traveling it and you realize how different these places are. Yeah, and I think that gets lost again when we're talking about China, monolithic China. This book really is an attempt just to dial the, to, tr to stop actually and say, listen, we can, we can deal with China on those high levels, but let's not forget how life is lived day to day and what those concerns are and how we can engage with that. But I had a, a Chinese official once, we were talking about urban planning in Beijing, and I said, you don't have to, I got really exasperated as one does sometimes, and I said, you know, you don't have to make the same mistakes America did. And he got very indignant and offended and said, we have every right to make the same mistakes America did. And that's part of growing, I know. Um, but it was very odd, you know, the book is called The Road to Sleeping Dragon because I started feeling over a period of years, you know, when you have the experience and you travel and you're doing reporting and you're fluent in the language or at least you've mastered enough of the language to work, so what? What does it all add up to? What does it mean? And there's a line in a T.S. Eliot poet about, a poem about, I had the experience but I missed the meaning. And I thought, I've had all this experience but what does it mean, right? And so. Toward the end of the book, I go to Wolong, Sleeping Dragon, and I try to convince local officials to not turn their valley into a, a panda theme park. And then I think, as everybody who's worked in China in some sort of official or semi-official capacity knows, that's when you realize, wow, I don't know how this place works at all. You know, there's undercurrents to this river that I'll never see or understand. Um, and that was my... That was my last stand in some ways <laughs> of, of trying to intervene.